Iraq, a country recovering from decades of war, sanctions, sectarian division, and the rise and fall of ISIL. It's achieved some progress in recent years thanks to its oil industry. But OPEC's second largest producer is now trying to diversify its economy by making it easier to attract foreign investment. Iraqis still suffer from a lack of adequate facilities, bureaucracy and deep-rooted corruption. Additionally, regional politics and US sanctions against Iran, one of its major partners, are impacting its economy. So can Iraq overcome years of conflict to face the challenges ahead? Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister and Oil Minister Thamir Ghadban talks to Al Jazeera. Mr. Ghadban, now that we've seen that sanctions have been levied against Iran by the United States, which yeah. is one of your biggest trading partners, how are you going to be affected by it and what is your plan? Uh, it has been clearly stated that Iraq will not be party to any group or alliance against another alliance in the area. Our main objective is to contribute to peace, tr tranquility, calm in, in, in the country, in, in the area. But it's not entirely up to you because you are uh, very in, in very close contact with both of these parties. You need yes. Iran for yes. security and trade. You need the United States for security at least. But you true that's training. Why, that's why we, can't, we are in a position to play a positive role. Okay. What is that role going to be? Well, we can go in between. Okay. We can also provide ideas. We can approach both sides because they are not on talking terms. Are you going to be affected by U.S. sanctions on Iran? I don't believe so. We are uh, an exporter of oil, so we are not really after waiver of importing oils from Iran. We are exporting oil. The only thing uh, as far as energy is concerned is that we are now importing gas and power from Iran because of the need. And this is not the work of the present government. We have inherited this uh, case and uh, we are working strongly to be energy independent. This is not to please the United States or anybody else or to displease Iran. This is a firm uh, stand long time ago and we were energy independent because of wars and sanctions and because of Daesh. We lost many of our uh, uh, strength as an example in the refining industry. We lost major refinery because of the destruction uh, inflicted on that uh, major refinery. So we are now uh, uh, working on, as an example, on the maximization of the utilization of gas. We are seriously working now and at a very advanced stage with ExxonMobil. And part of the mega project we are now uh, discussing with uh, ExxonMobil is utilization of 750 million cubic feet of gas. But all uh, this, this is just this one is, last, this is one last point. Short we term. already approved, we already approved the expansion of the Basra gas company, and they are now building uh, 400 million uh, cubic foot per day of gas. So, and within say the coming years, we will be definitely self-sufficient as far as gas and power. Absolutely. I mean, that's the desire. But it, this is all long-term planning. It's yeah. going to take a few years before yeah. you, you're able to do that. We saw when Iran, for various reasons, decided to cut off gas, what happened in Basra last year. In the short term, you are going to need Iranian gas. Yeah. How are you going to get it when the United States is telling you do not do business with Iran? No, uh, we have not, uh, let us say, been told this, and if, if we have been told, if I haven't heard it myself, but what uh, we understand is that the import of gas and electricity will continue this summer, no doubt about that. In the meantime, I have taken so much precautions. We have taken so much actions now in terms of uh, tying pipelines, increasing gas production, uh, maximizing our storage capacity, actual storage of uh, gas oil, connecting many power stations that they were not connected because of Daesh. You being the oil minister of Iraq, a country whose its economy completely relies on oil, how significant is oil to running the functions of Iraq? 
Oh, it is very significant. The oil revenue constitutes almost 92% of 2019 budget. Uh, it is an uh, unhealthy situation. We don't like it. I don't like it personally. We've been trying to break this uh, situation and uh, keep away uh, from totally dependent on oil, but it is not an easy task. Uh, it has been identified long time ago, but I think because of the adverse situation, the, you know, the difficulties that faced Iraq during the last uh, two, three decades, uh, the result of three devastating wars, uh, 13 years of sanctions, of course, the change in 2003 and what followed with the sectarian war and uh, killing, and then the rise of Daesh. Uh, so uh, the situation, the environment were not really healthy, were not conducive to diversify the sources of economy of Iraq. Uh, of course, we have identified long time ago that we should, as an example, uh, empower the uh, private sector in Iraq, uh, promote investment. Now, I have sat across uh, the previous government of Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi as well, and it's not what many, much different to what you're saying is what I've heard from them as well. Yes. Because they identify where the fault was, and during their time they had this justification that because there is an ongoing war, yeah. which you have uh, now inherited, that you know, there's a, a, the aftermath of that war. So what is going to be different in this administration, which will bring in investment and tell people that Iraq is a good investment, Iraq is a safe investment? As an example, uh, promoting Arab investment inside Iraq. The Prime Minister of Iraq uh, made a number of visits after about six months of not traveling outside Iraq. He took uh, you know, a, a large delegation, not only uh, from the public sector, but also from the private sector to Egypt, and it was preceded by also a meeting on the Iraq-Jordanian border. For an, we have taken and signed a number of uh, uh, what we call it memorandum of understanding for promotion of various activities, economic activities, and also promotion of uh, transportation uh, goods between the countries, uh, common and joint project, industrial project, uh, creation of uh, an industrial uh, area along the border between Iraq and Jordan. And similarly, we have signed so many also uh, memorandum of understanding for cooperation between Iraq and Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, the list will be even longer. So this is one, is that we have to make sure that the investors uh, will find a friendly environment within Iraq. It's not just the law. Of course, we have uh, an investment law, which is fair, with two amendments uh, that followed. But what really matters is the practice, the action on the ground, uh, how we treat the investors, uh, and also the procedures that have been well known in Iraq, the procedures to grant say, a license or to sign a contract or let us say imports of goods, entrance of goods and so on are slow. And therefore that uh, what we are now focusing is to ease and ease and simplify government procedures that are uh, related directly to providing services to the people of Iraq, to citizens as well as uh, to the investors. How are you projecting that people are going to come and invest in Iraq, where one of the major problems besides the instability is corruption? We are concentrating that all our contracts will be clean contracts. And I verbally inform all contractors when they come and see me, whether they are international IOCs or Iraqi private sector or Arab investors, that you don't have to deal with corrupt people, whether within the ministry or outside. My doors are open and you have my telephone number, okay? So we make sure that all the procedures, all the requirements for uh, engaging with contractors is to be, are to be clean and uh, 
to be away from corruption work or deals. But on the other hand, uh, the fields, the western desert, uh, the western part of Iraq, uh, okay, uh, because of Daesh, work has stopped in Akkas gas field and in the east in Mansouria gas field. I haven't, let us say, for the last four or five months, I've been uh, working on those. And we are now uh, assuring the security will be, uh, you know, uh, we have taken all the security measures to make sure that the contractor can come back and work in Akkas. If they cannot, we will take other actions. But we are definitely putting availability of gas for power generation and other industrial needs as top priorities. Well, oil is, like you said, it's crucial for the viability of the Iraqi state. You are in an area uh, where oil prices have stabilized slightly, uh, but they're not as, as what people desire them to be. They're not high enough. You are committed as an OPEC member to cutting down production yes. of oil. But the United States wants, with these sanctions on Iran, with Iranian oil possibly going off market, would want the, you to increase production. You've said both things, that you're committed to the, the cut down that OPEC has said, but you're also open to increasing production. So which one is it? What line are you going to take? OPEC was founded in Iraq, in Baghdad in 1960. And by the way, we are planning to celebrate its uh, anniversary next year in Baghdad, okay? So we are really committed and we have worked with uh, our colleagues within OPEC and OPEC Plus uh, last year. And we managed to uh, stabilize the market. So we are really targeting stability of the market, removal of the excess uh, stocks in the, in, in the market. At the same time, uh, we are ready for the, any event that it really require more supply in the market, but not unilateral, in coordination with our colleagues within OPEC. And this has been our firm policy. Let's talk about OPEC. Yes. It's the oil bloc which has been crucial to driving up or down oil prices and production in the world. But we're in, in a situation where there are concerns that have been raised by Venezuela and Iran. There's oil production that has been increased by U.S. How viable and how relevant is OPEC today? The OPEC is no more, as they say, cartel uh, producing uh, almost 60 percent of world oil production. I mean, look at the United States production now. It's number one, okay? Russia. And second, Russia, okay? So it's not really, uh, what we are doing is that uh, whenever there is a requirement to stable the market, to stabilize the market and uh, um, address the volatility, it is, you know, the task taken by OPEC. So they should really thank OPEC, those who criticize OPEC, they call it cartel or uh, they try to pass, you know, regulations against OPEC and so on. And even their companies, oil companies, uh, they always, in secret, in confidentiality, they thank us for the stability of the market and improvement in prices. Let me uh, quote what the Iranian oil minister said earlier, that OPEC is being threatened due to unilateralism by certain members and this organization is likely to collapse. Is that an assessment that you agree with? If it is the Iranian minister saying that, of course, I mean, this is his reaction because he feels the, the pressure of the sanctions, you know, imposed on Iran by the United States and he needs support. So it's understandable that he reacted this way. But to tell me that uh, OPEC is going to collapse tomorrow, I say no. But do you think that the unilateralism that we've, we've so heard of so much of, of uh, in recent months, uh, the relationship between the United States, uh, bet between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, between the United States and Saudi Arabia, and other OPEC nations who have been committing to one thing and on the ground the reality has been different. Do you not think that there is some sort of problem inside the bloc that is known as OPEC? If it has been like this in the past, we will definitely, Iraq now being a second, uh, uh, second in, in, in production within OPEC, we will not, will not really adorn, will not uh, uh, agree to this uh, unilateral uh, uh, control or, or decision by, by OPEC. We don't like definitely anybody to dictate terms and policies 
within OPEC and uh, those decisions got to be taken unanim unanimously. And this is part of the charter of, of OPEC. Uh, and uh, our, our relationship are actually on equal basis with all countries. Let's come back to Iraq's oil production. Yeah. Uh, it's been devastated, like you said, uh, in various wars and then in the latest fight against ISIL. How are you going to boost your production? As, as you were trying to do two tracks at the same time, yeah. you're trying to diversify as well as make sure that your production increases. For example, one of the largest reserves that you have are up in Kirkuk, where it's going to take massive investment for somebody to come in and explore those gas and oil reserves. We have now uh, contracts with at least 10 major international oil companies. And if we move forward with them to the plateaus that they have committed themselves to, there will be at least 2 million barrels per day increase on top of what we are now. We still have potential in our, uh, what we call them, nationally controlled oil fields that can be also increased in terms of production. So we want to regain our uh, old uh, Iraqi-Turkish exit, uh, as well as through uh, Jordan. There is a plan to uh, build a pipeline. And also within Iraq, the system requires uh, let's say more expansion capabilities. Uh, we are also working on this and the project I mentioned to you earlier with ExxonMobil, what we named it uh, the SIP, the Southern Iraq Integrated Project. It involves, besides development of oil fields, it involves development of tank farms, onshore pipelines, offshore, and building up the capacity, the loading capacity of our existing terminals and the, the SBMs to more than six million barrels per day. But this has got to be done in accordance with careful planning. It's not, we don't want to really increase our production capacity for the sake of having a larger capacity. No, we definitely are looking at the market, we are looking at uh, supply and demand, other uh, players, uh, economic growth in the world, and so on. There's a lot of focus on the southern fields and improving capabilities uh, in, in the south, but don't you think there's a lot of potential in the north? And how are you dealing with the Kurdish regional government on this issue? The largest reserve is in the south. And uh, Kirkuk, of course, uh, it's just an oil province. And uh, now we have uh, uh, a contract and a study being carried by BP to see what is the potential that we can develop the Kirkuk oil fields within Kirkuk governorates. Uh, we expect the study to be finalized by the end of the year. There is an early sounding that we can increase our current capacity by at least 50 percent. On the other hand, we are working on other fields within Mosul uh, area. I know there are heavy uh, oil fields, okay, the oil is heavy, but uh, on the other hand, we are thinking seriously of uh, a way of evacuating this oil, and the only way actually, or the most uh, uh, practical way is to build refineries there. What about the Chinese? There has been a, a lot of interest that has been shown by the chi Chinese yes. in Iraq's oil and gas industry. How deeply involved are they and how big is the investment and projection of what you're getting from them? They are one of the biggest actually. They are, let's say, 50%, uh, they have 50% share with BP in Romela, which is the largest oil field now in Iraq. They uh, operate the Halfai oil field. Um, it is uh, targeted to reach uh, 400,000 barrels per day. And they are the operator, they own 80% with them is total. And another company, Sinok, is operating the Misan oil fields, three oil fields. Uh, plus they have shares in other uh, uh, fields with other partners. And also we have smaller uh, Chinese companies in the south. They, they bought uh, Kuwait Energy, part of Kuwait Energy uh, assets. So uh, if you look at the capacity and uh, number of oil fields, actually they are number one. So energy experts believe that Iraq is now slowly replacing Americans 
with the Chinese. Is that something deliberate or is it just happening because of the investment that China is bringing in? No, this is not true. Because uh, from the very beginning, uh, oil, uh, international oil companies, they seek, uh, you know, that participation of Chinese companies for two main reasons. One, they, uh, they are investment rich, okay? They, they can contribute. And also they have the cheaper manpower. They came and they competed and they won by their own you know, merits. Yeah. Do you not think that the inherent corruption that there is in Iraq is something that Chinese companies have exploited? That Those are the alarm bells that have been rang by some Western energy experts, that China is finding it easier to go through the loopholes that exist in Iraq and taking over uh, at least uh, a big chunk of the Iraqi oil industry. I don't, I don't think so at all. Uh, what it's really... Uh, Evident what I, I mean, I wasn't involved in those, of course, contracts. I was outside the government. But when you analyze the role of the Chinese companies, uh, they are uh, more aggressive, they are risk takers, and uh, they prove to be also capable. They, they are really performing very well. Yeah, to be fair to them, it's not looking at, only at corruption and so on. Yeah. Okay, but you are, as we, as we discussed earlier, you are part of a country which is reliant on oil. You, you acknowledge that you need to diversify your economy. But what is the future of oil in your assessment? Because the world seems to be moving away from hydrocarbons. Yeah. Uh, so how long do you think the oil industry would be able to support Iraq as a nation state? And what are you going to do when, it, when, it, when it's no longer capable? No doubt gas is replacing oil. And no doubt also renewables are so... Uh, taking part in growing fast, especially in the transport and in the power sector. But then what about the petrochemical also, okay? And uh, even the replacement, when you look at it, uh, and you look at studies that have been carried by uh, capable people or institutions, the replacement is not really imminent. It's not in one year or two or decade or two. There are, uh, I mean, oil will continue for a number of decades uh, to come. It is required and uh, definitely we have to think about this seriously because it's not only us, it is also our future, the future generation of Iraq uh, we have to care about. And there are now, of course, talks within the government is that is to not only to diversify the economy but also to talk to think about seriously sovereign sovereign fund and also uh, bring in with time other sources of energy as an example we are now seriously uh, taking measures about the renewable especially the solar solar power uh, to provide electricity within the term of this government, yeah. Mr. Ghadban, finally, if you were to set three objectives for yourself, you are, you've come into an administration which is seeing a relative calm, uh, where foreign investment has returned to Iraq, it's, it's actually improved. Yeah. Uh, there is, there, the indica economic indicators are on the positive after many, many years. Yes, sure. So what are going to be the three things that once we meet you after a few years, you would say, this is what I wanted to achieve and this is what we've done? Number one, the capture of the flare gas maximum utilization of gas and be self-sufficient in terms of supply of gas for power generation and industrial uh, plants. Number two, and at the same priority, is the refining industry. Expansion of the present uh, refineries, integration, uh, upgrading, and building more refineries to expand the refining capacity so that we are also to become self-sufficient in terms of the requirements or demands for oil products. Number three is to maintain the present uh, production and export capacity, but add more flexibility and also take measures for emerg emergency situation, i.e. we have to have more outlets, export outlets, and not to rely all the time on the southern, southern Rules, although they are the main ones. Mr. Tamir Ghadban, Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister and Iraqi Minister for Oil, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.